Well, good morning, church. It is good to see you. I am just excited uh, about this announcement that's coming up. You know, we have seen our church grow uh, in, uh, in the last year a little bit, especially spiritually. Uh, we've grown, we've matured a little bit. Uh, you know, we've seen people, even despite COVID, uh, come to know Jesus Christ as our personal Lord and Savior. They've been baptized. It's been an amazing time to watch uh just something new happened in people's lives through this uh, time. Uh, you know, again, as I, I met with the eldership and as we meet on a monthly basis, one of the things that I'm encouraged by is the eldership's belief in 100% of the authority and importance, uh, and importance of the Bible in our everyday lives. You know, one of our core values here at Centralia Christian Church is the total authority that the Bible has in our in every aspect of our uh, everyday lives. And, you know, unfortunately in our culture today, not many are raised with, nor do they understand, uh, the uh, the history or his story uh, of love that they hold or that they read or that they listen to with their ears. And so the question that oftentimes remains is how will people know unless they're taught, unless they hear? And so again, what is our job as leaders? Our job as leaders is to equip you to do the works of ministry that God has given to you uh, for you to do in your sphere of influence. Whether that be at home, whether that's at church, whether that's in the world, your job, etc. Uh, you know, but as I look around daily, our, our culture has become darker and, and it just seems like the attack on our biblical perspective increases. And, and it makes today probably one of the, the most important times in our American culture for us to know why we believe what it is that we believe. Uh, to understand uh, not only history, but God's story, his story in the midst of this broken world. And so with that in mind, my friends, our church, Centralia Christian Church, we're going to walk chronologically through the Bible together, uh, starting in Genesis, ending in Revelation, and to have a better really grasp and understanding of God's letter, uh, his story uh, to us, and how our daily unique lives fits into uh, not only history, but his story. And so I'm excited this venture is going to take place uh, starting on September 20th. It's going to take us approximately 31 weeks to get through uh, 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 from Genesis to, to Revelation. Uh, and there is, though, a few things that in order for us to do that, I'm going to need you to kind of uh, make sure you you get, you stop by the church office. We pick up those kinds of things that we're going to be using on a daily, maybe even weekly basis to help prepare us for Sunday, uh, Sundays together uh, through the message and even our conversations that hopefully will continue into our small groups uh, during the week. We are planning on doing some in-person small groups. We may do it a little bit differently for this series and this series only. Uh, and we will probably also have uh, a, a Zoom or a virtual small group as well. And so uh, a couple of the resources uh, that I'm going to want you to get. Uh, number one uh, is we are going to use the framework of the story. Uh, we did this back in, in 2012, uh, but uh, we're going to have these books and this book only available for you uh, on September 13th. And so it's free of charge. We as a church want you to have it so that you can walk along with us in it. This will be used alongside the Bible itself. It's not the Bible, although a lot of uh, they, they kind of put it in a novel format for us to be able to kind of understand the flow uh, of the story in, in chronological order. And so again, uh, this is an adventure I don't want you to miss. Also, uh, for those of you who are fam have families and have kids in your house, they also have this. It's called... Uh, it's called the story for kids and and it's the same thing but on a kid level uh but you can read through a chapter a week that's kind of what we do and then have some a few discussion questions have with your family uh this is a great opportunity for you parents to set time aside and, and really be disciple makers with your kids really to to teach them the importance of, of scripture in their daily life you know i i picked this up uh i personally got a copy uh but i got it through kindle uh for my iPad and you know it was a dollar ninety nine on Amazon. 
on. So I want to encourage you uh, to look at that, to get that, to, to get ready for it. Um, but I'm excited about the opportunity uh, to uh, preach through uh, the Bible together and hopefully our knowledge will grow. And so uh, more information will come in the following weeks, uh, but we just feel like this is the right time for this to happen. And so again, we look forward to it and I hope that you're looking forward to it as well. God bless and I look forward to look at learning our story, how it fits into God's unique story his story. Be looking for it. New sermon series called Hashtag His Story. Uh, and, um, you know, and this would be a great, by the way, opportunity to invite friends to and get them started in the word as well. Talk to you later. Well, good morning. Uh, it's great to be with you guys again, and, and, and hopefully you're doing well today. Uh, we've been in this series on parables, and we've been here for a while. We're going to be wrapping up next week with that. But if you haven't been with us, uh, just a couple of, of things that we've talked about in regards to parables that I want to point out. First, the parable was a story that Jesus told. Right now, other people still told parables too, but we're looking at the parables that Jesus told, stories that help us to understand a biblical truth. And so I want to just remind us again that a parable is something that was cast alongside something else. So it's a story casted alongside a biblical truth to really help us understand uh, that truth in a way that wouldn't just affect our in in intellect but it would actually impact the way that we live it out. So the hope would be that we would actually live out the truths that we're learning. And so uh, we're in these last few weeks, like I said, we're in a section uh, that we're calling the Christian living parables. We went through the salvation parables, the kingdom parables. Now we're in the kingdom or the Christian living parables. And, and that's where we're learning how we're supposed to live in response to what we've learned over the last several weeks. And so last week I talked about the parable of salt and light and how we are supposed to be salt and light in the world around us and how we're supposed to impact our world in a positive way. And my prayer is that you've been thinking about this uh, and how to do that this last week. Now, however, though, in the thought of that, as I was kind of thinking about this myself, you know, the question may have come up like, what, what does that functionality look like? What does it look like to be salt and light in a practical way? And today we're going to look at a parable that answers that question for us. Actually, one of the guys in the story is actually looking for that information as well. And so the parable that we're going to be looking at today is found in Luke chapter 10. So if you have your Bibles or if you have your electronic devices, iPads, you know, phones, whatever, go to your Bible apps, open up to Luke chapter 10. And as you turn there, this is one of the most loved and well-known parables that Jesus taught. And it's known as the Good Samaritan. So um, as I was thinking about that in our culture today, we actually see a lot of things that talk about Good Samaritans, don't we? We have the Good Samaritans Club or Good Sam's Club. We have the Good Samaritan Society. We have Good Sam's Hospital there in Puyallup. We have uh, Good, uh, the Good Samaritan Ranch. We have uh, the Good Samaritan Movie. We have the Good Samaritan Insurance. We have Samaritan's Purse, nonprofit. We even have what's called the Good Samaritan Law. Right? It's prevalent in our culture. And again, not a lot of these organizations that I mentioned are Christian organizations uh, uh, because the fact is that even unbelievers are often familiar with the story, even if they couldn't tell you what the whole story is about. See, we understand in our culture the concept of a Good Samaritan. We understand that that concept is somebody that does something for, nice for somebody else, maybe that person that they don't even know previously. Right. And so when we hear stories of Good Samaritans, I think it connects with all of us. My question for you is how many of you like it when somebody else is a Good Samaritan to you? They did nice things for you and, and you didn't even see it coming. Maybe someone bought your coffee in line ahead of you or something like that. Maybe you didn't even know them. Right. Maybe it was totally unexpected. And I think that all of us would probably aspire to be a Good Samaritan as well somebody who's nice to other people and meets needs. And so we're going to look at that today in Luke chapter 10. And the passage we're going to look at gives us a little bit of context, a little bit of setup of what's happening. And then Jesus gives us the parable of the, of the Good Samaritan. So let's, let's start um, in verse 25. And I'm going to read 25 through 37. And I'm going to read from the Christian Standard Version today. It says this in verse 25. And I'm going to put my glasses on here. 
uh, for myself. But it says, Then an expert in the law stood up to test him, saying, Teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law? Jesus asked him. How do you read it? And so he answered, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. You answered correctly, Jesus told him. Do this and you will live. But wanting to justify himself, he asked Jesus, And who is my neighbor? And so Jesus took up the question and said, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell into the hands of robbers. They stripped him, they beat him up, and fled, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. And in the same way, a Levite, when he arrived at the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan on his journey came up to him, and when he saw the man, he had compassion. He went over to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on all olive oil and wine. Then he put on him, or then he put him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said, Take care of him, and when I come back, I'll reimburse you for whatever extra you spend. So Jesus asked, Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell in the hands of robbers? Well, the one who showed mercy to him, the, uh, the expert in the law said. And then Jesus told him, Go and do the same. So there's a lot in this story that if we, we don't know what to look for, if we're not paying attention, we can miss. And, and my friends, it's important stuff because it really helps to give a context of, of how we're supposed to love people and who we're supposed to love. And so Jesus asked this question by an expert of the law. And, the, and again, this lawyer would have been not like the lawyers that we typically think of. It would have been an expert in the religious law, an expert in the Mosaic law. And some versions will actually call him a scribe. And a scribe was one of the groups of religious leaders that were often connected to the Pharisees. And again, a scribe's job was to actually translate or to copy the scriptures so that there could be more copies of them. And again, I want you to understand that not everyone could do that. Not everyone was even allowed to do it. And so the scribes spent a lot of time copying the Bible, which made them experts in the law. And oftentimes people would come to them and say, hey, uh, in this part of the scripture, what does that mean? And, and that's what made him an expert. He was a lawyer. He was an expert of the law. And so Jesus answers this man's question brilliantly. The, the, the lawyer, he tees up the question. He says, hey, you know, Jesus, how, how do I get eternal life? And, you know, that's a pretty important question. I, I think most of us would ask that question as well. But Jesus actually answers it brilliantly using the Socratic method. Has anyone ever heard of the Socratic method? How, how many of you maybe heard about that in high school or in college and philosophy? And, but, but it was so long ago that maybe you have no idea what it is, right? Well, let me help you understand what it is. The Socratic method is simply asking somebody a question that you uh, already know the answer to in hopes that they'll follow the same line of thinking and end up in the same place at the same place in truth, right? This truth that you already know. And that's what Jesus does. And you know, and I think we do that oftentimes, even in our own marriages or in our friendships or relationships, oftentimes a question, a question that, that sometimes Crystal and I ask when getting into the car uh, to go to dinner is, you know, where would you like to go to dinner? And the answer is, right, some of the most common responses are, well, I don't know, where do you want to go? Even though, let's be totally honest, we've got, uh, uh, we've got ideas where we would like to go and ideas of where we would like not to go. And so we're hoping by asking the question that we get them to move to where we want to go, right? Or at least not to the places that we don't want to go. And so Jesus, by doing this, I mean, my friends, he's brilliant because what Jesus does is he places himself uh, at a spot where he's able to respond to the scribe's answer rather than the scribe's evaluation of his answer, right? He responds to the scribe's answer rather than the scribe evaluating his answer. And that's a smart move. Right? Jesus does this. And so Jesus said to, to this lawyer, he says, how do you interpret the scripture? Well, he goes, love God and love others. Right? In verse 28, Jesus affirms that the lawyer's answer is a good orthodox answer. He's like, yeah, you interpreted that scripture well. Nice job. But then Jesus basically tells him, to says, now you need to go practice what it is that you preached. Jesus says, do this and you will live. 
But do you remember the original question? How do I get eternal life? Jesus says, do this and you will live. Church, listen to me. Friends, listen to me. He never says, know this thing and you will live. He says, do this and you will live. See, because the, the scribe couldn't uh, possibly do this right? And there, there were going to be times when he probably wouldn't want to do this. There would always be somebody that he didn't want to love in the way that the scriptures had said. And so as a good lawyer, he wants to narrow the scope and the parameters down a little bit about who is his neighbor. And so he asks the question, so who's my neighbor then, Jesus? And Jesus answers with the parable, and, and, and here's why. The word neighbor in the Greek means someone that you have association with. It doesn't mean your next door neighbor. It could, but it's not how we think about it. The Jews, and again, particularly good Jews, only associated with other good Jews. And it would mean that the scripture didn't apply to Samaritans, didn't apply to Romans, didn't apply to foreigners, didn't apply to tax collectors. Basically, anybody else he didn't want it to apply to. So he's asking, who's my neighbor? And so Jesus then tells him the parable of the Good Samaritan to go, hey, that's great that you understand the law, but here's how you live out the law according to God's perspective. And so Jesus tells a parable. Jesus makes a statement. And so when he talks about the priests and the Levites being the ones that, that don't do what they're supposed to do, right? He says, hey, there's three guys here that came, a priest, a Levite, and a Samaritan. Right? The priests and the Levites, they would have been the ones who would have understood the letter of the law when it comes to loving others. That, that's why this expert of the law was able to quote it. But, but again, apparently their idea of love didn't require action or at least not the guys in the story, correct? And so Jesus is using them on purpose. Jesus knows what he's doing. So, so understand that's one piece of the context. Another piece of the context is that everybody would have been aware of this road that they're talking about from Jerusalem to Jericho. Everybody understands what this road is like. Uh, I did some research on it. It's 15 miles from Jericho to Jerusalem as the crow flies. But the walk is much longer because of the fact that it winds through all these mountain passes and it has these mountain paths. And inside those uh, mountains, because of the winding mountain paths, it was a favorite place for robbers to hide. Understand that Jericho was an important city, you know, ju just like Jerusalem was. But understand that Jericho is more of a resort town. It, it was an oasis city. It, it catered to the wealthy. Uh, as I did some research, I, I come to realize that many priests and Levites lived there. But the question is, where did they work? Well, for those of you who know how the priests and Levites work, they worked only in the temple in Jerusalem, which means that they would travel from their homes in Jericho to Jerusalem regularly. And so priests and Levites were constantly traveling on this road, and everybody understood this at that time. And so Jesus is telling them this parable, and as they're telling them this parable, they're like, yep, 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 makes sense. Oh, that makes sense. Yep, that makes sense. Even the part where somebody gets robbed. But what I think we miss sometimes is oftentimes what the road looked like. So think about this. When you think about a road, most of us are like, oh yeah, probably a two lane road, what we have today, probably not with pavement and paint like we have today, but probably wide. Well, that's not what the road looked like, right? Uh, let me kind of give you a picture of what, uh, of what uh, um, that we usually have. The picture is, the priest is coming along, and, and as he's looking ahead, he goes, Oh, there, there's a guy laying on the, on the side of the road. Man, I, I'm going to cross on the other side so I can pretend I didn't see him, and I can go on my way. And so, you know, we just kind of cross a, a, across this wide road, right? But that's not actually what the road from Jerusalem to Jericho looked like. It was more of a path. And really, it's almost comical in a sense to think about somebody going to the other side. In fact, I got a picture here, and you'll see it on your screen. And it's a part of what the road uh, to Jericho looked like, right? And so maybe, hopefully, that gives you a little bit of context. And so now you're you've got the priest, and and you got the Levite coming up, and and and, and they're going, oh man, I, I'm going to have to cross the other side of the road because, well, the cliff's over here, the crumbly canyon walls are over here, and, 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 and so it's kind of like, you know, you're trying to really not step on the guy. 
And so Jesus is making a statement that everybody understands because really what happens is it shows the heart of the priest and the Levite not responding to this obvious need that's right in front of them. It's not like they can walk around it. They have to step over the need, right? And, and the Bible says that this man was half dead. It means that his life was literally hanging in the balance between life and death and the priest and the Levite just step over. They just keep walking by. And Jesus is making a statement about that. And so the next person that comes by is the Samaritan, right? The Samaritan is the likely guy that's going to stop for this man in the story, even though Jesus doesn't say that the man who's laying on the ground is a Jew. It's what everybody would have been thinking because the majority of the traffic between Jericho and Jerusalem are Jews. And so they're thinking already that this is a Jewish guy. And so the Samaritans understand hated each other. Or the Samaritans and the Jews, they hated each other and they have for hundreds of years. There's, there's been hundreds of years of animosity. For example, the Jews could not stand the Samaritan. There was no such thing to them as a good Samaritan. The fact that I even entitled this message the Good Samaritan or Jesus would have been said the Good Samaritan would have made zero sense to the Jews because they didn't think there were ever a good Samaritan and that there was ever a good Samaritan, right? It would be like me saying uh, a good terrorist, you know, as far as terrorists go, you know, that guy's a pretty good one. We would never say that. And so the Jews would never call somebody a good Samaritan. In fact, it went so, it was, it went so far as they didn't even refer to them as a people, like a, 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 the nation of Samaria, right? They called them, check this out, a herd of Samaritans, like animals. It, it was like the worst possible insult that you could give a Jew was to call them a Samaritan. In John chapter 8, did you know that Jesus actually gets called a Samaritan? He's talking to some people who are Jews and Jesus says, hey, I don't think that you guys are even children of God because this is what children of God do and you're not doing what children of God do. And so they get incensed and they want to, to, to like, you know, cuss Jesus out. And, and so they're like, you, you Samaritan. It's like the worst thing they've got. And yet it's the Samaritan who's the one that step, that stops for this guy. And again, I want you to understand that Jesus is painting a picture here. And it's one of the things that, as I thought about this, is so brilliant about the story. Because we love stories of unlikely friendships, right? We love stories of people who help other people out who shouldn't have never have done it, right? There's a lot of books. There's a lot of movies that talk about it. You know, a movie that comes to my mind that, that was, oh, I think, four or five years ago. And maybe it was sooner than that, but it was called The Best of Enemies. And it was a story that was back in 1971, and it was a civil rights activist and a KKK Klan leader that are forced to work together because of school integration. And it's because of that relationship they come to respect each other, and that is what makes the story. Everything else is just facts about how these two people that should have been opposed come together, right? But that's the major part of the story, and it's what makes the story so good, and that's what Jesus understands here. The Good Samaritan obviously saw a person in need, obvious need. Life is hanging in the balance. And he stops and he goes above and he goes beyond the call of duty. It says he gets down, he dresses the, the man's wounds, and puts olive oil, he puts wine on it. You know, the wine would have been used as an antiseptic at the time. The oil would have been used to soothe the wounds. And he puts him on his donkey, he takes him to an inn. And again, it doesn't say how far off the inn is. It could have been several miles away. Who knows? But he says he takes care of the man and he leaves the innkeeper a large sum of money to make sure that this man is well cared for. It says that he leaves him two denarii. Now understand a denarius, just one denarius was worth a day's wage. And so figure how much you make in a day, times that by two, and that's what the man starts off with. And then he says, hey, I got to continue on my trip. But he tells the innkeeper, when I come back, if it costs anything else, I'll reimburse that as well. Just make sure that this guy is well taken care for. And so the fact that, this, that Jesus is using the Samaritan is important. That Jesus is drawing a strong contrast between those who understand the letter of the law and those who are actually living it out. Right? And that's the point of the parable. Don't, don't just understand God's law, live it out. I mean, listen to this, my friends. Don't just understand the word of God. Live it out. See, Jesus then does what we're, we've been asking you to do as leaders throughout this whole series is that he asks the lawyer if he understood what the parable means. 
right? He says, so who do you think was actually the neighbor in this situation? And, and as I was reading over this, it kind of hit me that the lawyer reveals his heart in this. See, I don't know if you caught it, but this expert in the law could not bring himself to say it was the Samaritan. When Jesus asked him, he says, it was the guy who showed what? Compassion or mercy, right? He, he couldn't bring himself. His hatred wouldn't allow him to say the Samaritan was the good guy, was the hero in the story, and that's telling. But I love Jesus' response. He says, go and do likewise. Go be like the Samaritan. Go be like the guy who you hate in the story, who's supposed to hate the Jews because he's actually the one who's living out God's law. See, he doesn't just understand it intellectually. That's the problem with many of us Christians today is that we're just like the expert in the law. We understand it intellectually, but we're not living it out. And I think there's the three perspectives in the story I, I kind of want to look at that I think many of us live by. What do you mean those three perspectives? Well, as I go through them, I want you to be encouraged. I want to encourage you to be thinking, how do I live my life? Not intellectually, what do I think is right or wrong, but how do I actually live my life? And the pers first perspective that I think we may live by is, is that of the robbers, right? Because their perspective was, what's yours is mine if I can take it. And that's been the case for many people for thousands of years. Might makes right. If I can take it from you, now it's mine. And maybe you struggle with that perspective in your life right now. And again, as I thought about this, I think there's reasons why people have this perspective in life. For one, I think it's a part of their upbringing. You were taught, look, nothing comes to you for free. If you want something, then you better take it. And who cares who you step on in order to do that? You better take, you better, uh, take what you want because no one's going to give it to you. You know, I, as I was thinking about that, most people, though, who are in this place, who are in, who maybe are in this place, are there because of experiences of over and over and over and over and over in life, people have taken from you. And you finally got to the place where you're like, no one else is going to take from me. I'm going to take from them before they can take from me. Either way, the robber's perspective, it leads to a hardness of heart. And I want you to understand today that God wants to heal us of that mindset. That second perspective we see in the story is that of the religious leaders. Their perspective is what's mine is mine, but you can't have it. Like these religious leaders, they're not going to steal things from people, but it, it's this is our stuff and you can't have it. See, they had this lifestyle, if you really look at it, that they were trying to protect. They were exclusive. They were basically considered religious royalty. And so they don't want anybody taking what they have, including this man named Jesus. I, I think that's why so many of them opposed Jesus, because they were afraid that Jesus was going to take from them what they had. And, and I think there were probably reasons that they gave themselves that they that would make it okay for them to step over the guy, to, to not help this guy who was beat up and lying there. Some of those excuses or thoughts maybe in their minds could have gone like this, okay, you know, uh, or, or you may be saying when I tell you this, okay, well, you know, that would have been a legitimate excuse, right? Maybe some of the things I'm about to share with you are things that we say to ourselves or not, but maybe their excuse was, you know, this guy is dumb for traveling alone on a path where known robbers are by himself, right? He got, he's got what he deserved. That was his bad. It's not mine. But, but I want you to understand for the priests and the Levites, there was even additional stuff. Right, as they were coming up again, and, and it says that they were ha this guy was halfway between life and death. Right, Maybe this guy wasn't moving. Maybe they th would have thought, man, this guy's dead. Uh, understand that priests and Levites were forbidden to touch dead bodies. They were, however, there was a few exceptions to that, if that dead body being that of a close relative. right? But in general, they weren't supposed to touch dead bodies. Now, they didn't know he was dead. But the law allowed them to check to see if somebody was dead, right? But both the priest and the Levite would have had consequences for doing this. Because if they would have touched a dead body, they would have been ceremonially unclean for seven days, which means they were unable to do the things they were supposed to do in the temple to help out God's people, right? Those guys are, were probably on the road from Jericho to Jerusalem to actually perform their temple duties. 
So they can tell themselves this, man, if I stop and this guy is dead and I touch him, I'm now ceremonially unclean. And really it puts me in an inconvenience because I can't work, right? And maybe I don't get, maybe they don't get paid for those days wages, right? Not only does it inconvenience me, but it inconveniences the other temple workers that I'm going to have to work with, right? They're going to have to take up the slack of me not being there. It inconveniences the people that I'm supposed to minister to. And so I'm just going to let somebody else do it. I mean, that's really, if you think about it, that's a pretty legitimate excuse, right? Except for that's the thing. It's an excuse. The, the question for you and me is what excuses do I make when God presents somebody that's in obvious need and we don't respond? What excuses do I make when God presents somebody that's in obvious need and we don't respond? You know, maybe it's, uh, I'm not going to give them money because their lack of wisdom landed them in this place, uh, landed them in that, this place, uh, where they're at in the first place, right? Maybe it's, I don't want to intrude on their situation and because that would be embarrassing to them and embarrassing to me. Or, or maybe how about this one? You know, I'm not going to share my faith because what if I mess up and what if I do more harm than good, right? I, I, I've used all of those excuses at one time or another, right? When people were in obvious need. But you want to know the one thing that I, the, the one excuse I use most often is that I don't have time. You know, the thing about me is I love efficiency and I, and I pack a lot of things in my day and, 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 you know, and I think that if I stop and help that person in need, then it's going to make me late to my next thing. And then I'll be late to my next thing. And they, t but you want to know what my next thing usually is, if I'm being honest. My next thing usually has to do with the church. Or sometimes it has something to do with my family. But think about this. What if I showed up to my next thing and said, sorry guys, or sorry people I'm late you know, to this meeting I, or this event or this thing because uh, this person was in need and, and I stopped to help them out. Do, do you think anyone's really going to be upset or mad at me because I did that? No. It's an excuse, right? If I'm actually doing that, no one's really going to be mad. You know, sometimes we make excuses to not answer that need that God's putting right in front of us. And again, that's simply an excuse. The Samaritan, though, had a different perspective. The Samaritan's perspective was what's mine is God's and he can use it any way he wants. And sometimes you've been the recipient of that even in your own life, haven't you? And so again, there are these two important aspects of this perspective because again, uh, this is uh, in the context of love. And so in, in those two aspects are this, how do I show love and who do I show love to, right? And so Jesus showed in the story how we're supposed to love. And so by taking the Samaritan and having this guy go just and just have him going above and beyond what was required, no one could ever look at that Samaritan and go, you know what? I think that Samaritan had ulterior motives. No, he was obviously loving and that's how God wants us to love others as well, whether we know them or not. You know, sometimes I, I think we get to the point where you know, we say, well, I have warm feelings towards people. I say nice things about people. I even pray for people, you know, and again, all those things are great. But at some point, I believe that God calls us to do more. I think that God actually calls us to respond with our actions, you know, to the way that we're called to love. James 2 verses 4 through 17 says, what good is it, dear brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith, but don't show it by your actions? Can, can that kind of faith save anyone? He says, suppose you see a brother or sister who has no food or clothing and you say goodbye and, and have a good day, stay warm and well and eat well, but then you don't give that person any food or clothing. What good does that do? So you see, faith by itself isn't enough. Unless it produces good, good deeds, it is dead and useless. See, this is talking about excuse me, talking about our faith and the and that that and the thing that saves us, right? That leads us to salvation. And James is is saying that it's not the good deeds that save you, but if you don't have good deeds, then your faith isn't genuine. And if your faith isn't genuine, then how can you possibly love in the way that God calls us to love? It's a great thought. In Matthew verse chapter 25, Jesus is talking about the end times. I'm going to turn there and he says, this is what's going to look like and people are going to be judged and, and people that didn't love are going to go over here Right. But but then he goes, oh, I'm going to start in verse 34. 
of Matthew 25, and he says this, Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you took care of me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we, we see you a stranger and take you in or without clothes or clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, Truly I tell you, whatever you did for the least of one of these brothers or sisters of mine, you did for me. And then he will also say to those on the left, Depart from me, you who are cursed, into eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you didn't take me in. I was naked, and you didn't clothe me. I was sick and in prison, and you did not take care of me. See, when we love others, we love God. And one of the ways that we love God is how we love others. I want you to understand they're not separate. It's why the guy's response, the, 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 the expert in the law's response was correct. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Understand, those two things are connected. We don't get to separate the words of God from the heart of God. And I think the part of the problem is, is that we have such a narrow view of what this parable is talking about. I mean, how many of you, let's be honest, when you hear this parable, and many of you have heard it before, think of the guy who's sitting on the street corner with a cardboard sign that says, I need help. How many of you think about that? Right? I mean, that's what I've thought about oftentimes, because that's somebody who I don't know who says they're in need. That may be an example, but I believe it's certainly not the end of all examples. It might be the lady in your office that has her face in her hands who has obviously been crying right? It might be the kid in your class that's bullied and never seems to fit in. It, it may be a person in your life group who, you know, that has an unforeseen financial crisis that they don't know what to do with. It might be that person in your family that's made yet another mistake and has landed in this place of crisis again. I mean, maybe it's a middle school or, or a high school event here at the church where we need help in making it happen, where, where by you helping allows the leaders to be freed up to share the gospel of Jesus Christ, but they wouldn't be able to do it in such an effective way unless you were there. You know, we all have those types of needs uh, all the time here in the church, whether it be hospitality, life groups, uh, being a life group host or a life group leader, uh, whether it's community needs, benevolence here, whether it's being a CE worker, right? A Christian education worker, when we open that back up, right? The, you know, we, we've had people who have done this and have responded to, to the call that many others, you know, would just step along to the other side of, of the street to avoid. And yet some of you, and, and as you're watching this, you've answered those needs even in our church. And I want to say thank you so much. Right? Thank you for helping us. Thank you for helping us continue the legacy of building strong God-honoring families that will impact our communities. See, I want you to understand it doesn't always have to be the guy who's sitting alongside the road. God has given you a sphere of influence for the purpose of influence. Right? It might be your family, it might be your church, it might be in your life group, your neighborhood, whatever. You know, we have, we have this diagram that we use here at the church called the Four Spheres Diagram. And you'll see it on your screen. And it talks about our sphere of influence that God has given us, that he wants us to influence. Right? And, and the first sphere, on, on, the one in the middle, is our relationship with Jesus. And, and that our relationship uh, with Jesus, and, and again, out of that relationship... We should, be, uh, we should be influencing our families, our church, and our world around us, right? It's what God has called us to do in making disciples. And so who's in your sphere? You know, the sphere is also in your notes, so you can also download it online here, and you can see it and pull it up and look at it. But again, in your sphere, where, there, where might there be a need that God is calling you to meet? And again, let's be clear, God doesn't call you to meet every need. Jesus didn't meet every need of every person that he ran into. Did you know that? See, Jesus didn't meet every need. But Jesus wants us to be aware of the world around us, and he wants us to answer some needs. 
That's why he's given us resources. That's why he's given us abilities. He's calling us to love the world around us, right? And that some of those people would come to love him as well, those that we help. And so the question is then, what needs do I respond to? Well, I can't tell you that all the time. I honestly have a hard time figuring that out myself sometimes in my own life. But here's some things that I can tell you that might help. What are the needs that are right in front of you? See, sometimes people ask you to help in a way that, that as you think about it, isn't going to help. And I think we need to respond in wisdom and go, just because somebody is asking for help in a certain way, doesn't mean that I have to help them necessarily in that way, right? I can get more information. I can look at the picture. I can actually offer help that I believe will actually help. And, and sometimes getting that information may require extra counsel from mature believers, right? I mean, there, there's, there are needs that sometimes we have to address right now, right here in this moment. But most of the needs that I'm presented with, I have time to think about. I have time to pray about. I have time to ask other mature believers, how am I going to respond to this? I feel God putting it on my heart to respond to it. How do I do that? Now, I want you to know, I've never once regretted meeting somebody's need that I thought God called me to meet, even if I uh, didn't get to see how it played out, even if it played out in a way that I didn't want it to play out, right? But I still, even in that, I've never been at a place where I was sorry I did that. But I have, on the other hand, regretted not meeting some of the needs that God has placed right in front of me. You know, one last thing I want to kind of point out as I close is I know I've been talking about what we do to love people, right? What actions do we take to love people, right? We have some people that only talk about it and only think about it. We have other people who do a lot of nice things, but I want you to know at some point for many people, the nicest thing that we can do for them is to actually share our faith, amen, to share the gospel of Jesus Christ, right? You, you don't get just to think about love and not do it. You, you don't just get to be nice and not ever share your faith, right? Do you pray about opportunities to share your faith with people? Because oftentimes that's their greatest need. It's a spiritual need. It's not either or, it's both and. And so today maybe you're watching this and you're the man that's in the ditch laying half dead spiritually. And you know it. You know that today. You know you need somebody to heal you spiritually. I want you to know today that Jesus died on the cross so that he could do that for you. He wants you to respond. He's reaching his hand down like the good Samaritan to help you up. And if that's you today, I would love to talk with you about that. I would love to pray with you about that. I would love to help you in your journey. And so I would encourage you to give the office a call. 360-736-7655. You know, uh, email us here at the church, office at centraliachristian.org. Let us know so that we can help you. For those of us in this uh, that are watching this today that are believers, maybe our hearts have become hardened. This week I was thinking, what, what if Jesus looked at me like the Jews looked at the Samaritans? You know, honestly, like I've looked at other people. What about that? There are some things that we can do intentionally to respond to this because... I believe God wants us to put this into action. And so again, in your bulletin notes, there's that spheres diagram that's in there. And I would encourage you to take that diagram, begin to write down specific names in those spheres that God might be calling you to meet a need. I would encourage you to do this. Pray for opportunities this week. But again, when I pray for opportunities, I'm shocked how, at how often that when I do pray for those opportunities, regardless if my eyes are more open or whether God brings them to me, God brings those opportunities to minister. My prayer is that this has been uh, an eye-opening experience, a time for you that God has, uh, through his spirit, really um, maybe convicted our hearts. That maybe we find ourselves more like the priest and the Levite than we do the Samaritan. And I hope that maybe uh, that this would be a, a message that would soften our hearts and that we would begin to do the good works that God prepared for us in advance to do. That we begin to share the gospel, we begin to meet needs the way that Christ asks us to. 
again i would encourage you you know it's look in the world look around look in the church look where you can meet needs we have a whole bunch of different needs in, in the church whether it's it's greeting people whether it's helping set up whether it's uh, meeting community needs we have help in club mom which is a community need where we're helping to you know clothe uh, the children of our community we need help with that surely would love to have more help with that and I want to encourage you to to maybe consider even that. Um, but, you know, I believe that that this message is timely. I believe that God put this on my heart for a reason. And so I just want to encourage you to understand that and understand what God, what is God asking you to do? What is he saying to you and what are you going to do about it? What is God asking you to do and what are you willing to do about it? Father God, thanks again for this day. Thank you for this opportunity to um, hear this and, and to be able to do this in freedom. Father, I pray that you would just help us to see opportunities of needs that we can meet in your name. And Father, that uh, we know that as we meet needs, that sometimes th through those needs, someone will come to you. But a lot of times people may not either. But Lord, help us to, to know that as we're helping the least of our brothers and sisters, we're doing this to you, Jesus. We're helping you. And so help us not to hold back anymore. Help us to, even during this time of COVID, during this hard time right now that we're going through, help us to even stand out uh, even more in this time. And it's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. I love you guys. I look forward to wrapping up this series next week and moving on to uh, uh, the, the next series, uh, hashtag his story or history and finding God, our story. Uh, our unique story in in God's story. So uh, I look forward to it and I look forward to seeing you. God bless. Love you guys.